Ambassador John Edward Herbst is director of the Dina Patrizu Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C. Prior to this position, Ambassador Herbst worked as director of the Center of Complex Operations at the National Defense University, also in Washington, D.C., from 2010 to 2014. He retired from the U.S. Foreign Service in 2010. His last four years in the Foreign Service were spent as coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization Affairs. Ambassador Herbst has served as the U.S. Ambassador to both Ukraine and Uzbekistan. He was our ambassador in Uzbekistan, uh, incidentally, when 9-11 happened and the operations that took place in Afghanistan in those weeks uh, immediately following that very much depended on close coordination and support and, uh, and John was our, our man in Uzbekistan. It was a very important staging point for us. He also served as U.S. Consul General in Jerusalem, which meant in effect he was the U.S. Ambassador to the Palestinians and at that point in time U.S. Envoy particular to Yasser Arafat and the Palestinian Authority. He's written extensively. His articles have appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, and International Herald Tribune. He's appeared frequently on national and international television as well. Ambassador Herbst and his late wife, Nadia Kristoff, were married nearly 37 years. They are the parents of five children, and they have five grandchildren. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ambassador John Edward Herbst. Fred, thank you very much. That was much kinder than I deserve, as the audience will understand shortly. Uh, I'm here tonight. Okay. I'm here tonight because there's a crisis in Ukraine. And it's a crisis that has attracted substantial, albeit not substantial enough, world attention over the past 14 months. And most of the information that you've been presented about this crisis has talked about it in the framework of a Russian-Ukraine problem. But I have some news for all of you. This is not principally a Russia-Ukraine problem. This is a Vladimir Putin problem. And if Western political leaders were wise, they would understand that, and they would understand that no matter how much attention the media pays to ISIL or to Boko Haram, the problem of a rogue president in control of one of the world's two largest nuclear arsenals is easily the most important national security challenge that we face today. Okay, I hope that got your attention. <laughs> I'm going to take you on a very quick historical tour to help you understand the problem represented by Mr. Putin and his kleptocratic, autocratic state. The problem we have in Ukraine right now goes back to a deeply shared historical understanding among the Russian people. Uh, all nations develop their own sense of history. And the Russian sense of history first appeared in print in the 18th century. There was a prominent Russian um, writer, historian, his name was Tatyshev, who wrote the first comprehensive history of Russia in the mid-18th century, followed by another very, very famous Russian historian, Karamzin, who wrote 40 or 50 years later. And the story that they told was this, that the origins of the Russian people and the Russian nation began with the city of Kiev, or as the Ukrainians call it, Kiev, um, Kiev Kievan Rus, which emerged in the um, ninth and 10th centuries. And the line of Russian historical development, because the, the Kiev and Rus was conquered by the, by the Mongols, as was mo all of the steppes of Central Asia and then of Eastern Europe, starting in the early 13th century. And then in terms of development of Russian history, 
leadership moved from Kiev and Rus to the uh, to Muscovy, the boyars of Muscovy, the Grand Prince of Muscovy, and from there, Muscovy began to become an empire, the Russian Empire, associated with Saint Petersburg, which Peter the Great built. And this is the Russian history as understood by all Russian students, and for that matter, any American student like me who learned Russian history. And this, in fact, is a disabling element among many of the Russian um, scholars in the West. They never broke away from this paradigm. Related to this is the notion that, yes, there is a Russian people, but there is also an all-Russian people. And the all-Russian people consists of great Russians, a.k.a. the Russians, little Russians, a.k.a. the Ukrainians, and white Russians, a.k.a. the Belarusians or the white Russians. And in this historical understanding, the legitimacy of the Ukrainian people, and for that matter the Belarusian people, are as the little brothers of the great Russian people. And what I've just described is understood um, in Russia as simply the way things are, the natural order of life. What this means is that in, now of course this is, this is not true of all Russians, but it's true of a vast majority, including most importantly many senior Russian officials. What this means is there's no real natural Ukrainian nation and Ukrainian people. They are the little Russians. Ukraine really kind of belongs with Russia. And you'll see as I talk, as I move from this, you know, this deep historical background up to the more recent present and to the very present, how this plays out, how this is manifest. Okay, so this is point one. Point two, um, I don't know if any of you have read Henry Kissinger's book, Diplomacy. Actually, almost everything Kissinger writes is worth reading. The, um, the man is a national treasure, which is not to mean he's always right, by the way, but he is always very smart. And he wrote in Diplomacy, and he's not the only one who's noticed this, that over the course of several centuries, the Grand Prince of, of Muscovy, which became then Moscow, which became the Russian Empire, have expanded at the rate, I think, of the size of the Netherlands every month. And the Russian Empire kept expanding, expanding, expanding. Uh, and when the Russian Empire fell apart during the October Revolution after World War I, and the Soviet Union replaced it, it too continued that expansion, including at the end of World War II, when it picked up territory throughout Eastern Europe. Well, a funny thing happened after the fall of the Soviet Union. A funny thing that was actually the result of a conscious decision involving the then president of Russia, Boris Yeltsin, as well as his Ukrainian counterpart, as well as his Belarusian counterpart, and for good measure and local color, their Kazakh counterpart, Kazakhstan being a major country in Central Asia. They decided that the Soviet Union should dissolve. So this was not some American or some CIA plot as some Russian fervid thinkers think today. They decided on the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And when you take away the, the Soviet Union was compro comprised of 15 republics, um, nominally uh, autonomous or independent, but of course under direct control of Moscow. Um, three of them were the Baltic republics, which of course quickly broke away from the Soviet Union. But then the other 12 became 12 independent countries. And when that all happened, Russia shrunk, lost, what, about 25, 30, 35 percent of its territory. That still left Russia by a factor of two at least, the largest country in the world. But, a very important but, for the first time since the Mongol invasion, entity called Russia or Rus was shrinking in space, not expanding. Now, those of you who studied the Soviet Union or post-Soviet Russia know that 
there has never been a reckoning in Russia with the horrors of the Soviet period, the way there has been a reckoning, for example, in Germany with the horrors of, of Mr. Hitler's reign. So what you had among the elite in Russia at the time that the Soviet Union fell apart, even though Yeltsin was a principal or the principal actor in its dissolution, was this sense of great loss. And the national security apparatus, the KGB, the military, the Ministry of Interior, which is the, the, the police, the Ministry of um, the Border Guards, and the Ministry of External Situations, which is kind of like our FEMA, but add a lot of weapons to it. Uh, but you get the idea. These guys never really accepted the, not so much the demise of the Soviet Union, although they regretted that, but the loss of great Russian territory. They never reconciled themselves to it. And let's remember that Mr. Putin was a career, not very successful, and not very imaginative operative of the KGB. Okay. So that's the second point you need to keep in mind. Let's see now. What are my third point? That's right. I would bet that most of the folks in this room, most of you, within the last 12 months have heard this peculiar phrase, frozen conflict. I would also imagine that most of you, before the past year, have never heard this phrase. But let me talk about it a little bit. Frozen conflicts are conflicts on the periphery of Russia involving states which have a substantial minority or more than one substantial minority. And in these conflicts, the Kremlin has backed the minority to establish its clear preeminence, as opposed to the central government of the other country, in the minority areas, and as a point of pressure on the government in these countries to pursue policies that Moscow likes. These are, that's a extended but clear definition, I hope, of a frozen conflict. And if you were someone who watched this part of the world after the Soviet Union fell apart, you would know that there were frozen conflicts in Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan has an enclave which is overwhelmingly in population Armenian. And the Armenians in this enclave, Nagorno-Karabakh, wanted to be independent from Azerbaijan. And essentially, Moscow served as a conduit to represent the interests of that community in Nagorno-Karabakh um, on behalf of the Armenian government. So that's one frozen conflict. A, there were there actually three in Georgia. This is the country of Georgia. One was in the province of Ajaria. Another was in Abhazia. And a third was in southern Ossetia. And here, too, Moscow emerged as a protector of the different ethnic groups in these three provinces of Georgia. And a third country which had a frozen conflict since 1991, since the Soviet Union fell apart, was Moldova. It has a, an area called Transnistria, meaning it's on the other side of the Dniester River in the country of Moldova, the eastern side. Uh, Moldovans are by ethnicity very close to Romanians. The Denizens of Transnistria are largely Slavic, both Russian and Ukrainian. And Russia became their champion in Moldova as a way of exerting pressure. And this was a policy executed by the various intelligence services of, of Russia, the FSB. And actually, this is something worth noting. The old KGB in the Soviet Union was split into two in Russia. Just like the United States has a CIA which does stuff overseas and an FBI which does stuff in the United States, the FSB is supposed to be the internal security apparatus in Russia and the SVR is supposed to be their uh, foreign policy secure intelligence apparatus. The interesting thing is that it is the FSB that has responsibility in Russia for dealing with all the countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union which gives you a sense as to how they view these countries. Okay, 
So, from the fall of the Soviet Union, Moscow, which in the 90s was pursuing policies which we largely liked, was following the policies of frozen conflict in its neighborhood. The only place it really did not do that was in Ukraine. It toyed with it in Ukraine. There was a crisis in 1992 when a leader in Crimea, which at that time, as, as now, was majority ethnic Russian in composition, made claims about wanting to leave Ukraine, either to become independent or perhaps to join Russia. And there are nationalist politicians in Moscow who at that time were very supportive of this. But we expressed some concern and basically the, the Russian game stopped. There was a similar episode in 1995 with the same outcome. So the frozen conflict game was not played in Ukraine. In the 90s, in part because Russia was weak, in part because Russia was pursuing policies that would be contradicted by a frozen conflict policy that the United States and Western Europe opposed. Because Russia needed American help, for example, to join various international organizations, especially on the economic side, to become a member of the G8, as eventually did, and so on. My point here, though, is to tell you that the crisis in Ukraine was foreshadowed in the 90s. Okay, so that's the third point. The next point takes us to the more immediate past to today's crisis. And this takes us to the early aughts, the early 2000s, the first years of the new millennium. Uh, Putin became president at the end of the 1990s. There was a managed transition from Yeltsin, the previous president, to Putin. And initially, he pursued policies very similar to Yeltsin's. And he and George Bush got along at the beginning. And George Bush famously looked into his eyes and saw his soul. Uh, at the time, at the time, actually, Putin helped Bush. And I can explain that if you want, but that's not relevant to this theme. But Putin, the proud, lifelong KGB operative, as he uh, produced some order in Russia, and that's to his credit. There was a crime problem in Moscow, for example. Uh, there were shootouts on the streets. And those largely ended in Putin's first years. And to his credit also, Putin introduced, I would say, a combination of fiscal austerity, which was needed initially, and fiscal discipline, which is always useful, something Washington could learn. Uh, also to the benefit of Russia, to set the groundwork for real growth. Um, but then there was the other factor, which was not Putin's doing, but which empowered him, which was the substantial rise of oil prices in the early 2000s, which gave him money. Because the Russian economy is based overwhelmingly on hydrocarbon exports, oil and natural gas. So the point I'm making is we began to see changes in Russia, which bring us to today's crisis, uh, in the early 2000s as Russia began to strengthen. It came back from this period of historic weakness. And a strong Russia should not be a problem per se. The United States welcomed this development at the time. The second point for this this period of the early 2000s um, brings us to another term of art, frozen conflicts being the first, colored revolutions being the second. Now, I'm sure you've all read this phrase, colored revolutions, over the past year or so. Let me tell you what this means. First of all, colored revolutions is a Russian term. It's something that the Kremlin devised to explain phenomena where civil society in uh, authoritarian governments revolt against their autocratic leader, and they revolt, revolt successfully. But they don't revolt by conducting a revolution where they have 
armed men who are shooting government officials. They have massive public demonstrations, which leads both to chaos in certain ways, but also brings out uh, a broader sense among the people of those countries that the government's got to go. And the first such revolution uh, or change was in Serbia, which has been a, a Russian client even in the post-Soviet period. The second one was in Georgia in 2003. The third one happened when I was in Ukraine in 2004, 2005. And there was one that was called a college revolution, but really wasn't in Kyrgyzstan in 2005. Mr. Putin and his regime were deeply unhappy with these things. And because they run a quasi-police state where rule comes from on high, they assumed that these events could not possibly represent a people expressing unhappiness or disgust with leadership. They decided it must be a CIA plot. And if you read Russian literature on this, it's all right there. The point is that Putin saw this as a challenge, not just to his influence in, the, in his near neighborhood, what he, what he calls the near abroad. Because governments which toss out autocrats and want democracy and a market economy and don't want corruptions are not governments that are going to get along with Mr. Putin's Kremlin. <coughs> so from his standpoint, this was a serious problem, requiring a more assertive policy than the policy of frozen conflicts. We only began to understand over time what this meant. We had some inkling when I served in Ukraine. I was there from 2003 to 2006. The, the quote-unquote Orange Revolution, which was not really a revolution, uh, prevented the 2004 presidential elections from being stolen and led to the election of the opposition candidate who, when they had a, f a free and fair election, won handily. In any case, to prevent this outcome, the Russians put in about $1.5 to $2 billion in terms of campaign money for the incumbent, or rather for the for the party of incumbency. They deployed their media and a vast disinformation campaign to uh, darken the opposition candidate. And at that point in time, their media was very influential in Ukraine. They, I believe, although no one's proved this, poisoned the opposition candidate. I say that they did it because, as far as I know, there were only three countries which had the capacity to do it, the United States, Israel, and Russia. And you figure out which one of these had a motivation to do that. Uh, so they did, and then finally, finally, after Yushchenko won, in fact, a year later, for the first time, they turned off the gas to Ukraine. They are the supplier of gas to much of Western and Central Europe and the principal supplier of gas to Ukraine, like 80% of Ukraine's gas supply. They turned it off in the winter as a form of pressure on Ukraine. So we began to see at this time again, more aggressive Kremlin actions to uh, forestall, limit, overturn these quote-unquote cold revolutions. Okay. Uh, next point. The Russian response or the Russian management reaction to cold revolutions moved to military. I'm talking about the crisis in Georgia in 2008. And let me provide a little background on that for you. I mentioned a few minutes ago that Georgia suffered in its early days of independence from three frozen conflicts, one in Ajaria, one in Abhazia, and one in southern Ossetia. Well, as a result of its colored revolution, what they call the, um, the, the Rose Revolution, in Tbilisi in 2003, they got a dynamic leader, Misha Saakashvili, a real reformer, incidentally, although something of an authoritarian, which we didn't pick up on until too late. 
Uh, and Saakashvili actually, while Russia was sort of sleeping, seized control of Ajaria and established Ajaria as a constituent part of Georgia. I remember remarking at the time something like, remarkably did that, he better not try it again because the Kremlin will be ready for him. And in fact, as things turned out, it turned out not the way I, I, I suggested uh, a couple of years earlier. What happened was this. Starting at some point, I couldn't give you the precise date. I was in Ukraine at the time. It might have been 2005. It might have been 2006. The Kremlin began a series of things to provoke Georgia. And those series of things were, every few months, they would bomb the place. They wouldn't bomb Tbilisi, the capital. They'd bomb outlying regions. And sometimes um, Georgian security officials would be killed in these bombings. Or you know, they would, some villages would lose um, buildings and such. And in 2008, Putin set a trap for Saakashvili. Uh, there was constant, or I shouldn't say constant, I would say periodic uh, conflict at the line of control between Georgia and the governments such as they were in Abkhazia and Southern Ossetia. So they'd be shelling across those, those borders. That's not borders, across these lines of control, because it's all within Georgia, as we understand it. Uh, the Kremlin set it up so that there was some border shelling. Georgians responded. And uh, the, Jor the Russians suckered Saakashvili into taking a shot at Russian soldiers, which justified, in Moscow's mind, sending the, the Russian army in to take control of Abkhazia and southern Ossetia. So ever since the war of August of 2008, uh, the borders of Georgia have changed. Those um, territories declared independence, recognized by Russia and I think two or three other countries. And we, we saw the application of military force by Mr. Putin to change borders. So this is the background of Kremlin actions to the crisis in Ukraine. Now, as Mr. Putin developed his policies, he also developed a doctrine to justify these policies. Um, this is the, the next point. It's the doctrine, the right of the Kremlin, the duty of the Kremlin to protect ethnic Russians and Russian speakers wherever they happen to live. And a lot of them don't live in Russia. 25% of the population of Kazakhstan are um, ethnic Russian. Comparable numbers in Lithuania, uh, excuse me, um, Estonia and Latvia, not Lithuania. Lithuania is about 6 or 7%. Um, in Ukraine, it's a large number. This is a doctrine which the Kremlin has asserted proudly since the first time Putin became um, president, and for that matter, even before that. Uh, in fact, right after the fall of the Soviet Union, when Ukraine was voting to be a dependent from Russia, Yeltsin, of course, a very liberal Russian politician, and Gorbachev, the last general secretary of the Soviet Communist Party, and a rather liberal figure, were also saying to Ukraine, if you be vote for independence, um, we will, you know, we have this duty to protect ethnic Russians and Russian speakers. So this has been a constant theme, which Putin has made a doctrine, a doctrine justifying not just action, but aggressive action. So all of this is the prelude to the crisis in Ukraine. And I, mean, I spent a lot of time talking about this. Let's talk briefly about the crisis in Ukraine. It began in November of 2013, when the then president of Ukraine, <coughs> someone who had a pretty good relationship with Putin, Viktor Yanukovych, a man I know well from my time in Kiev, was about to sign an agreement 
with the European Union a trade association agreement which would ease uh, customs barriers between the EU and Ukraine. Mr. Putin did not like this idea, and Yanukovych backed away from it at the last minute. Most people think he backed away from it because of Putin. I'm not certain of that. I think there are other factors, too. It really doesn't matter for this conversation. He backed away. Within 24 hours, he had tens of thousands of Ukrainians demonstrating in the main, um, the main uh, square in Kiev, the Maidan, a name you may have heard of. Uh, and he then made a very serious mistake, Yanukovych. He sent his police in to disperse them, roughly. Um, they didn't disperse. And the next day, there were not tens of thousands of people in the square. There were hundreds of thousands of people in the square, not demonstrating against the EU deal squashed, but against the authoritarian practices of Mr. Yanukovych and his regime. And those demonstrators stayed in the square from late November until February 22, when Yanukovych fled the country. When Yanukovych fled the country, the Russian position was this was a coup instigated by fascists and CIA against the lawfully elected president of Ukraine. And within um, a day or two, these quote unquote little green men began to appear in Crimea. Those little green men <coughs> were in fact Russian military officers without their insignias. And they multiplied and took control of the Crimea and by early April, not only was Crimea fully under Russian control, but the Russian parliament had annexed it, in quotation marks. And later, Putin acknowledged that those, in fact, were Russian soldiers, for anyone who was naive enough to think they weren't. Uh, that was not really, though, what Putin needed in Ukraine. Because what Mr. Putin wants in Ukraine is a compliant government. And if you hive off the part of Ukraine which is the most sympathetic to Russia and leave the rest alone, you've got a Ukraine that is even less sympathetic to Russia than it was before. So what's a dictator to do? Well, he goes into his toolkit and he pulls out a frozen conflict and says, let's have a frozen conflict in Ukraine's east. And so far, starting in early April of last year, people began to appear in the Donbass um, trying to stoke a rebellion. Only one problem. Almost none of the locals are interested. While it's true that up to 25% of the people in that area were well disposed towards Russia, in fact, up to 25% in polls said they would be willing to be independent from Ukraine, or join Russia. That still leaves a whopping 75% who don't agree. Equally, or perhaps even more important, of that 25%, they were largely older. And you don't make revolution with old timers, I can tell you. You got to have the youth. And even among the youth who are somewhat sympathetic to um, a Kremlin agenda, Almost no one was willing to pick up arms. So they had to create their own rebellion. And you do that with money. You do that with leadership. You do that with arms. You do that with, dra with sort of dredging up the dregs of society. And you do that with your own soldiers, albeit not necessarily called soldiers, and often cases intelligence operatives. And so that's how this insurgency, if you want to call it that, got off, got off the ground. And because there was no pushback from Ukrainian authorities, from early April through May, they made substantial progress, territorial gains. But after Ukraine had a presidential election and Poroshenko became president, they launched a counter-offensive, which was very successful. Uh, it was very successful even though in response, the Kremlin began to send in heavier and heavier arms, T-64 tanks, uh, Serious anti-aircraft weaponry. Ukraine used its military, its air force, in this counter-offensive. But once they put in these sophisticated missiles, in fact, they didn't just put sophisticated missiles into Ukraine. They were firing sophisticated missiles from Russia into Ukraine. They took out the Ukrainian air force as a factor. They had to stop flying because their planes were being shot down.
Now, as you all know, one of those missiles shot down a Malaysian airliner. And by the way, a, a very good piece just appeared in um, Der Spiegel, no, Die Zeit, a German newspaper, uh, a, lo a lengthy report written by German and Dutch journalists, which points the evidence overwhelmingly at the, at, at the separatists with um, Russian support as responsible for that shoot down. And they also, the Russians, in trying to stop this counteroffensive from Kiev, put in, uh, put in lots and lots of volunteers. Now, whether or not they were technically volunteers, as they chose to do this, they were not regular Russian army units. But even that did not stop the counteroffensive. And by mid-August, the Ukrainians were on the verge of surrounding the two small areas controlled by pro-Russian forces. And if they had surrounded them, they would have cut off the supply, which means they would have quelled, the re quelled this rebellion. That's when the Red Army went in. So in late August, Putin sends in his army. Um, the army, of course, is much stronger than Ukraine's military. And they, they send the Ukrainian military reeling back westward. Uh, but of course, even the most, um, even the most cautious Europeans had to acknowledge at this point that Russia was engaged in a war in Ukraine. And this led to uh, the first real serious sanctions by the Europeans against Russia for their aggression in, in Ukraine. A ceasefire was established, and that ceasefire has not really, it was established September 5. It has not really been observed. 225 Ukrainian soldiers have died since the ceasefire was established. And in fact, a, a new Russian offensive may have started the last few days. And our ambassador in Kiev, Jeff Pyatt, said today that new Russian troops crossed the border uh, yesterday and got involved in fighting. I don't know if this is going to be a replay of August, but the point is the situation is more serious today than it was a few weeks ago. So this is the Ukraine crisis, and I've explained to you the origins. Uh, we need to understand, though, that this crisis, however Ukraine, this Ukraine crisis, however it turns out, is not the end of our Putin problem. Or put another way, unless Ukraine rebuffs the Kremlin, succeeds in at least stopping any further Russian gains on its territory, and begins to develop as a normal uh, democracy and market economy. Unless that happens, we will see Putin provocations in other countries. And let me just give you a few examples. Uh, in late August, at the same time that his troops were destroying the Ukrainian military, Mr. Putin attended a youth festival, which he hosts every summer with uh, leaders of Russian-sponsored organizations, youth, youth organizations across, across the great country, at a place called Lake Seliger. And at this event, which he'll, he'll show up and, and schmooze with the students for a day or two, so they devote serious attention to this. In fact, this may be one of their responses to the cold revolutions. They want to make sure they have youth on their side. Uh, at this event, some young woman asked an exceptionally complicated and sophisticated question about Kazakhstan, in response to which Mr. Putin said the following. Kazakhstan is an artificial country. Same thing he said about Ukraine to Mr. Bush at the NATO summit in 2008 in Bucharest. And he said, you know, Nazarbayev is a genius. He's created this country out of nothing. And right now, they treat Russians well. But you know, after Nazarbayev passes the scene, if they don't treat Russians well, well, maybe we're going to have to do something. So Mr. Putin was signaling his ambitions well beyond Ukraine. Now, we, the United States, have good relations with Kazakhstan. But we have no obligation to defend Kazakhstan. Uh, we do have an obligation to defend Lithuania and Latvia and Estonia, which all happen to be members of NATO. Now, the NATO, NATO has an annual summit and had a summit in Wales, which ended on September 5. Or maybe it was September 3, in any case. Early September it ended. It was a Friday, I remember that. And 
At that summit, they talked a lot about Russia and about the problem of Mr. Putin's policies, albeit not with the degree of rigor and steel that is required, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but clearly, Mr. Putin was peeved. And just before the summit, as a way of reassuring our Baltic allies that we have their backs, President Obama went to Tallinn, the capital of Estonia. So you've had two things designed to buck up the morale of our easternmost members of NATO happen in, late, in early September. Well, Mr. Putin has a card or two to play himself. So what does he do? The day the NATO summit ended, two days after Mr. Obama was in Tallinn, Putin kidnaps an Estonian official from Estonia and takes him to Russia where he sits in jail. Now, which event do you think had a larger impact on the view of the Baltic peoples in early September? The NATO summit saying, Russia, 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 we're watching you, better be careful. Or Russia stealing the, Ukraine, the Estonian counterintel guy. And just to make sure that the Balts did not misunderstand his intention, a few weeks later, he seizes a Lithuanian ship in international waters in the Baltic Sea. What has NATO done in response to these things? All right, exactly. Exactly. Okay. So that's the situation. So right now, Ukraine is fighting our fight. And this is improperly or not properly understood in Western capitals. And that's unfortunate. The West is slowly waking up to this Putin problem, but only slowly. We still think ISIL. I mean, you know, talk about strategic jokery. The whale summit declared that ISIL was a strategic threat to NATO and said nothing comparable about Russia. Metternich would be spinning in his grave. OK, so what are we to do? What should our policy be? We need to be doing several things to treat with the Ukraine crisis and more broadly, the Putin challenge. It all starts with a proper understanding of the problem, and I hope we've, I've given you some of that tonight. But one, the one thing we're doing well is our policy of sanctions. Um, on balance, the West has done a pretty good job, at least with the last round of sanctions with the US put in place in, in midsummer and the Europeans in September. They are so quote unquote sectoral sanctions which have serious impact on the ability of Russian hydrocarbon industry to use modern technology to develop, uh, to get further uh, oil and gas. And place serious constraints on their financial sector. So that's, that's one thing we've done well, and President Obama deserves a lot of credit for this, because the Europeans were reluctant. Second thing we should be doing, we need to make Mr. Putin pay a very high price in Ukraine for his aggression. And here, Putin is vulnerable. He is telling his people that there are no Russian soldiers fighting in Ukraine as Russian soldiers. There may be some Russians fighting in Ukraine as volunteers, but no Russian army units. This is false. Again, the Russian army went in in August. We have reports now that's going in now. And Mr. Putin is hiding his dead from his own people. There's an organization in Russia that is called something like the Mothers of Russian Soldiers, a very popular organization. When the president of that organization said in late August, there's a, over 10,000 Russian soldiers fighting in Ukraine. It was immediately declared a foreign organization and shut down. So this is a, a serious vulnerability. We need to provide weapons to Ukraine, weapons that shoot, so that if Russia aggresses, continues its aggression, more Russian soldiers go home dead. The more Russian soldiers go home dead, the harder it is for Putin to hide this, the harder it is for him to continue his aggression. Um, there has been an extraordinarily short-sighted policy in Washington, also in Europe, that providing Western weapons to Ukraine would escalate the conflict. Well, hello. We've seen about a half dozen escalations by the Kremlin since this began in early April. 
Mr. Putin is afraid of casualties. If you want this war to stop, the best thing you could do is make it easier for Ukraine to protect its own soldiers and kill the enemy, kill the aggressors. Let's understand. I mean, it's not pleasant to say this, but this is aggression. And, you know, we did not, we did not fight Hitler with blankets, you know? Okay. Which is not to say that Putin is Hitler. Hitler was more dangerous. But Putin is very dangerous still. Uh, third thing we need to do. I just described, I think in honest terms, not especially flattering terms, the wisdom of our NATO leaders assembled in Wales. What NATO needs to do is to explicitly acknowledge that the Russia policy it has followed since the late 90s is no longer valid. Russia is not the partner. Russia is at, at best um, an opponent, at worst a serial aggressor. And there are different policies needed to deal with a serial, serial aggressor as opposed to a partner. And these policies include putting serious military assets in, our, in the Baltic states to dissuade aggression there. Wales decided to put essentially a company of American soldiers into the Baltic states. Well, we need a battalion or two. We need some serious hardware. Serious hardware designed both to forestall aggression and to send a little message to the Russian general staff that your aggression in Ukraine has prompted countermeasures which you have to worry about. Now, we, should, we can at the same time as we do this say we are happy to have a dialogue about all questions so we can resolve the crisis in Ukraine and we could change the stance of NATO. But first you have to have steel before you can have effective talks when you're dealing with a man bent on revisionist change like Mr. Putin. Uh, also, a very specific point. There are spots in the Baltic states that are ethnic Russian majority where it is plausible we could see the appearance of little green men. Um, I specifically have in mind the area of Narva in Estonia. There should be contingency planning in NATO right now to deal with just such an operation. Finally, the West should reach out to the countries which are not part of NATO, offer them a security dialogue. Uh, Georgia, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, other states of Central Asia, Moldova, just to get a better sense of what's happening there and how we could strengthen them short of, of course, we're not going to send in our soldiers, but even short of us providing military equipment, although we shouldn't necessarily rule that out in the current environment. Those are the policies we need. Uh, all of these things on the security side, from supplying weapons to Ukraine to strengthening NATO's resolve, require strategic leadership from Washington. That, unfortunately, is absent. I give, and I've spent a lot of my time working in the Middle East. I give President Obama credit for much more intelligent policies than his predecessor in the Middle East. I give President Obama credit for not pursuing provocative policies towards Iran. But he's kind of at sea on this crisis in Ukraine. He just doesn't understand it. And he's demonstrated that multiple times. And that's a serious problem. Our Congress understands it much better. And that's why Congress voted in December to um, Ukraine Freedom Support Act, um, which calls for us to supply defense and weapons to Ukraine. I'm hoping and expecting we will see that happen this year. But that's, I outlined the things we need to do. If we do that, we make sure that Russian aggression does not go beyond Ukraine, and hopefully that Ukraine can reestablish control over its east and develop along a normal path, not subject to aggression from, from Mr. Putin. Thank you. I'd like to take uh, the next 15 minutes or so for questions and answers from the audience. would encourage, in particular, the students in the audience that would like to address a question to Ambassador Herbst. We have the uh, microphone over on this side. Please, when you uh, go to the microphone, identify yourself. And if you just maybe take one sentence to say what is your background, your connection uh, to the Russian 
or Ukrainian-speaking part of the world. We've done this today and uh, just identifying the tremendous capabilities we have, particularly in the student body in these foreign affairs, is, is, is a reassuring thing. So I'll ask you to come on over here, and that light is positioned just so we can't see uh, who's lining up there, but we'll go ahead, please. Hello. Hello, my name is Joseph Gooden. I'm uh, not really involved with uh, Russia or Ukraine in a sense, but I'm a political science major and have been following this story closely. Um, I've been asking myself in, 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 in these last few months about the similarities between uh, Putin's policies and, and Hitler's policies in, in the late 1930s. And you mentioned Hitler several times in, in, your, in your speech. And, and I'm wondering, a lot of people have argued that if Hitler had been stopped with, with sanctions or with political measures uh, much sooner than perhaps uh, his invasion of the Rhineland could have been prevented or perhaps um, you know, greater measures could have been prevented. And um, what I'm wondering is what kind, of, what kind of influence, what kind of measures can be taken now against Putin specifically to pressure him um, in that sense, to keep him from expanding even more than he already has? Oh, I think I've at least partly already answered that question. Uh, we need to maintain sanctions. Uh, we need to provide substantial military support for Ukraine so that they can um, either stop further Russian aggression or make any further Russian aggression very costly in terms of casualties. We need to develop a policy in NATO which makes it absolutely clear that we will defend the Baltic states. Uh, all of these things, to my mind, would stop Putin where he is right now. And Putin is not Hitler. Hitler was a much greater danger for two reasons. Hitler was in control of a very modern economy and society. Mr. Putin is not. And you need to have a modern society to be a world-class conqueror, at least in the modern age. And also, while Putin is a risk taker, we don't know if he's a risk taker of the world-class that Hitler was. I mean, Hitler's risk was a willingness essentially to take on the entire world. You know, not just France and Britain, but then also the Soviet Union. And for good measure, it's worth remembering that Hitler declared war on us. We didn't declare war on him after Japan, after Pearl Harbor. So we don't, my sense is that if the West showed determination, uh, Mr. Putin would stand down. It's also true regarding Hitler in the early years um, whether or not he would have stood down if we had said no at the Rhineland or no in Austria or no in, the Czech, in Czechoslovakia, we do know that his general staff would have said no to him because they knew they could not, at that time, they did not feel they could have won a war against the West. Um, my name is Brett Mon. I uh, served a church mission for, or the, for our church in Armenia, which has also suffered a lot of those same uh, policies that the Kremlin has been enacting on Ukraine. And my question is, you, you kind of already answered this, and you feel that Putin would stand down if we were to do these, these steps of, I guess, arming Ukraine and a bolder position. Why do you, what factors do you feel like contribute to that, and what would prevent him from escalating the situation further when, when he is gaining so much popularity because of his, po because of his policies and taking a stand against the West? Okay, there, there are several questions in there, and I'll try and answer them. Um, first, um, if I conveyed the impression that I am certain the steps I outline will stop Putin, uh, I'm, I apologize, because that was not my intent. These are the things we need to do, uh, and I thought I said that if we do these things, we should at least be able to prevent Putin from doing more stuff beyond Ukraine, and hopefully we'd be able to stop in Ukraine, but I didn't say for sure I thought we would. I think it's very much a question mark if Mr. Putin will stand down in Ukraine, even if we do all the things that I've said. 
Um, I do believe, however, that if, if all of these things happened, and this is a very important end, if oil prices remain low for several years, which I believe they will, then either Mr. Putin will have to stand down or his popularity in Russia will disappear and he'll have a serious domestic crisis to manage. I think that's highly likely. Again, if all those conditions obtain. Now, uh, you talked about his popularity in Russia. His popularity in Russia is based, first of all, on the fact, as I mentioned during my talk, during his early years, he brought, partly because of his policies, partly because of luck, a measure of prosperity to the country. Well, guess what? That prosperity is disappearing, and people understand that. Um, his, he's also popular because he has a media which dominates uh, Russian life, and people don't have access to real information. And that media extols him as the greatest thing since Peter the Great. Uh, but even that media cannot protect him if the Russian economy crashes and people don't have jobs and don't have enough food and don't have any future. And this is the risk for him in the current environment. The sanctions which we put down in the summer and fall of last year ha have become much more effective as a result of the sharp drop in oil prices because um, industries in Russia need to refinance now, especially because oil prices are so low. And guess what? Because of sanctions, they can't. That's why Mr. Putin's been bailing out his friends in big industries and big enterprises in Russia. But that also means he'll have less money to help the average Russian. So he's got some very serious problems right now. And while the Ukrainian economy is racing to the, into the chasm, um, the Russian economy is not far behind it in that same, on that same path. Next question. Howdy. Um, I'm Nathaniel Nelson. I'm not particularly connected with Ukraine or Russia. I just have a general interest in the subject of global stability. Um, I was wondering, the Russian history has a long, long history of mentality kind of dictating what people do. Um, I was wondering, in Russia right now, they, as far as I, from what I've heard, they're very anti-West. Putin's um, playing the West as attempting to destroy Russia. I was wondering how, what steps should we take to change the, I guess, the hearts and minds of the Russian people so that they're, even if the popularity of Putin falls, that somebody else won't step up and ride that wave of anti-Westernism and that we can be friends, not just... Um, not just have a cold relationship with Russia? Uh, there are a number of reasons that explain the strong anti-Western um, sentiment in Russia. Um, one are the decades of anti-American and anti-Western propaganda during the Soviet regime. A second was the failure of market reform in Russia in the early 90s. There was a crash in the economy and Westerners and their advice were blamed for that. And that blame was, was at least in part, fairly, um, fairly apportioned. And then three and most immediately is the massive anti-Western campaign in Putin's media that's and it has been going on at least since like 2004, 2005, and which has stepped up greatly over the past 18 months. Uh, if you were to provide normal news in Russia, the um, anti-American sentiment would drop substantially, not completely. It, there would still be a, a noticeable element, but it would be much less. And the analysis I gave a few minutes ago about what's going to happen in Russia applies not just to Putin, but to his successor. So if, say, there is serious turmoil in Russia because of declining living standards as a result of those factors we, we talked about. Um, it's possible Putin might be replaced by someone of a similar mindset, but within months he'll have the same problem Putin has. Uh, if oil prices remained low, the Russian economy could still get a boost if they took steps which led to the lifting of sanctions. And that boost would be felt very quickly in Russia. So 
there would be a serious political reason for a more intelligent, less aggressive Russian foreign policy in, these, in this environment. And again, that happens. The media in Russia you know, starts, starts becoming a rabid purveyor of anti-Western attitudes. The views of the Russian people would change. Thank you. Well, sir, um, my name is Ben Wolfley, and I'm connected with Russia. I, I served my mission in Europe. I'm also a member of, of the Army ROTC here. And as a potentially a future soldier, my question is pretty simple. Um, what would it take for the United States to go to war with Russia? And uh, if so, do we know what, what, what that war would look like? Oh, uh, I, I, I know of no one in our military who's looking for a war with Russia, or for that matter, in our political leadership. And for that matter, while Russia talks a very nasty anti-American game, they understand the deep dangers for them of winding up in an actual shooting war with the United States. Uh, their military, their non-nuclear forces would have no chance against the American military. Uh, I think, there, in other words, I think there's ample caution on both sides, even with the risk taker in the Kremlin right now, to make that scenario very, very unlikely. Having said that, uh, the mere possibility of this, since again, Russia has this enormous nuclear arsenal, is a reason for certain caution. But that caution should not be so large that it permits Mr. Putin to have his way with other nations and with international treaties and with established borders. Okay, thank you. My name is Joseph Bowler. I'm actually here on home leave. I'm coming from Tashkent, my next post. I'm a U.S. diplomat. Uh, my, my next post is, is Moscow. And uh, w what are some steps that the American government could take in order to increase um, ma ma actions from our European counterparts and to encourage them to actually ma maybe do a little more in their own backyard? I think that President Obama has done a pretty good job, I mentioned this earlier, on persuading the Europeans to put down serious sanctions. Uh, and I think the, the close coordination we've had with Europe, not just on sanctions, but in, in NATO, has been useful. I just believe that that coordination could have been put to better use for more ambitious goals. You know, even at the height of the Cold War, when Europe understand there was a serious Soviet threat, it took determined American leadership to take uh, security measures against that threat. For example, the deployment of INF missiles in Europe in the early 80s, which led immediately to the INF Treaty in the late 80s. So Europe's always going to be nervous about those things, which is why you need clear strategic vision in the White House and some steel in the backbone of the President. Again, we haven't been seeing um, the strategic vision on this question, um, unfortunately, although maybe over time we'll see more. Thank you very much, sir. We have time for one more question. Thank you. Okay. Ambassador Herbst, my name is Bradley Anderson. I study international relations, and so I try to make it my business to know what's going on and sort of the, on the, in the global arena. And Russia is a very large part. My question specifically um, addresses a point that we haven't necessarily talked about. We've talked a lot about sort of um, outside influences that could possibly uh, disrupt Putin's ambitions. Could you comment on maybe are there domestic influences that might uh, also disrupt his ambitions? Well, the way I described it, it would be a combination of international and domestic factors that might force, force President Putin to change his policies. Now, again, the Russian people um, don't approve of Russian soldiers fighting in Ukraine. So if it becomes absolutely clear to the Russian people that Russian soldiers are fighting and dying in Ukraine, that will have an impact on Putin's popularity, on his measure of support, and ultimately on his ability to govern. Similarly, a seriously declining standard of living would have a uh, similar effect. So it would be the combination of international and domestic that either force a change in Kremlin aggressive policies or force a change in Kremlin leadership over time. 
so that's how I see this, this playing out. There's one other point that I'd like to make because uh, I don't want anyone to leave this room thinking that my views or sympathies are against those of the Russian people. Uh, the great Russian historian Kluchevsky wrote that there is a direct 